The Chiefs on a school night, yes. Big yes. honor to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 23rd Aviation Women Panel from Ladies Beyond Flying. My name is Daniel Stecher, Vice President Allen Operations, IBS Software, and it's a big honor to have you all with us. Uh, and it's an even bigger honor to have uh, another great uh, guest speaker with us. I very well remember the, the day when we first met. It was 21st July 2016 in Frankfurt. And um, at the time, I was working for another company. And what I was hearing while talking with him was so convincing that I said, I have to join his company. And uh, I'm very proud to be since uh, five and a half years with IBS Software now. And also the company is giving me the freedom to drive for Ladies Beyond Flying. And I thought, why not inviting the founder and executive chairman of IBS Software uh, on stage to give some more insights about his view on the travel industry and how he is seeing the future of travel. So I proudly introduce VK Matthews. Stage is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, all the participants of the session. It's a great privilege, honor, and pleasure for me to participate in the session. Daniel gave me almost six months notice, so I can't complain. So if I haven't prepared enough, it's entirely my fault for the session, <laughs> not because I was not given enough time. So uh, I know it is aviation women panel, ladies beyond flying. Uh, I'll have few um, comments about the gender diversity in our industry and, and, and the world in general, particularly on the occupational front. But uh, what I would like to cover uh, today, uh, uh, three, four uh, key agenda items. One is the, I will frame the travel business context, the economy and the travel business. All of you know it, but I will give uh, some sort of a perspective so that the topics that I discuss subsequently will be uh, uh, interesting. Then we will talk about what are the major changes that have taken place and that are taking place. And what are the major trends that we see? And the fourth and the last point that I would like to cover is the road ahead for us uh, as, as business people, as well as uh, travel industry uh, professionals. So we just came out of COVID after official report of about 550 million people getting infected and close to 6.5 million people uh, dying. Uh, the actual figure could be much higher. My expectation is no less than a billion people uh, and probably about uh, you know, 10 million, if not more people dying. Uh, we were recovering, the economy was recovering. Then we unfortunately have the Russia-Ukraine crisis and also the, the China supply chain related issues because of the way in which they are managing COVID with uh, not high tolerance as other countries have done. Increasing inflation, interest rates, and now most of the CEOs surveyed talking about a recession coming in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, that's what they planned for. It's best to plan for the worst uh, and hope for the best. Uh, and we are also seeing globally, ladies and gentlemen, growing income inequality. Uh, that's also there. That's the background. And if I really look at the travel business context, travel business environment, Actually speaking, it is very promising. The IATA AGM is just getting over in Doha, which is just 45 minutes of flying from where I sit. I didn't attend this, this AGM. And last two AGMs, of course, I in person did not attend. I used to attend the AGMs before. So if, you, if I really look at the travel industry as a whole, and then we can come to the aviation industry. As you know, the size of the travel industry is that in 2019 pre-COVID was about a close to $10 trillion, 9.6 to be precise. 
which was then about 10.3 percent of the global GDP. In 2020, that is 19 to 20, it shrank by about by over 50 percent. And in 2021 last year, we grew by about 27 percent, still a small percentage of the global GDP. We are one of the hardest hit. And this year, we are expected to grow, and this is confirmed by, I was yesterday talking to people in Boeing as well as in IATA, and we are expected to grow about 48% and taking the GDP back, the travel GDP back to about 8.4 trillion. And next year, by end of this year, and next year, we will be back to pre COVID levels. And what is even greater news in the thick of all of the economic crisis and recession uh, fears that we have? The good news is that we are forecasting for the next decade, 2022, that is this year, to 2032, next 10 years, we are forecasting a CAGR compound annual growth rate of 5.8%, which is the highest that we have ever recorded in a century, and a CAGR decade. And we should read about 1.4, 1.45 trillion dollars, which then will be about 11.5% share of the global GDP, which is very good, which is very promising. In fact, we lost a lot of jobs during this period. And in fact, the new jobs that we are creating are unfortunately not at the low wage uh, brackets. Anyway, now if I take this to the airline business, which we are very closely linked to. Here again, we the the news is good in 20 this year. The lot factors, if I really look at April, May, the lot factors are almost at 94 percent of the pre COVID levels. Uh, and the domestic travel has picked up very well and international travel Capacity, if I talk about capacity, is domestic capacity is about 80 to 85 percent, and international capacity is back only about 60 percent. But the good news, however, is that this year, that is 2022, we are almost 50 percent of the year gone. We will be the industry will be losing just about 9.9 .9 plus billion dollars compared to $42 billion last year and a whopping $138 billion in 2020. So that means we are doing quite well. And if you look at the passenger traffic, the passenger traffic this year is expected to be about 3.2 billion passengers and the RPKs will be roughly about 90% by the end of the year. Yeah, which is good news, international and this one put together. And this is when you compare the, the few years, it's pretty well. Now, the good news there is out of the $790 billion of the industry revenue, close to $200 billion is coming from cargo, which is almost double what the cargo revenue used to be pre-COVID. This year, 2022, is a little bit less compared to last year. Last year was the best ever in the history of the aviation business, cargo business, $204 billion air cargo business, because there was no capacity, because the passenger capacity was not there. So therefore, the yields were much better. Of course, the cargo carried was not as high, but the yields were very, very good. So cargo did well. This year, Understandably, if I look at two regions, particularly Asia Pacific and Europe, the cargo capacity, uh, cargo carriage is coming down a little bit, particularly this month, the month of May. Uh, but LATAM, surprisingly, is doing very, very well. That area, all other, so we are slightly more. So overall, overall, I would say that, and and the going forward. Uh, the growth is expected also pretty, pretty high. Now, what it means is that we thought with all of the technology changes and with all the technology available, people will travel less. And what we are seeing and what we are forecasting with all of the scenario planners doing the planning, 
what we are, what we are seeing is the opposite. We may not be traveling for certain functions as we did in the past, but the travel dates back to the beginning of humanity, as I always say. So it's part of our living, and I think we, we are not going to give up. That's good news. So for the travel industry, that's pretty good. Now, if I, you know, give after giving that context, let me just talk about what are the major changes that we have gone through and what are the major changes taking place. One of the biggest change that I can talk about is the accelerated technology adoption all around. Not that we didn't have these technology before, it's just that COVID has made it mandatory. We had to accept there are people who are, and in fact, if you look at people from in the age group of 50 to 70, these are very, very influential people in the world. They run countries, they run companies, and those people, if you look at 90% of them never attended a webinar before COVID. And they all preach technology transformation, but individually they did not have that. Now they have become the proponent of that, and this is really driving the change because the, that group of people are quite influential. And that change is taking place, and we have seen it online deliveries, telemedicine, whatever it is. But if you look at every company now, is thinking about becoming a technology company. Well, what I mean to say is that they are not trying to become an IT company. What they think is that they have to, unless they take full advantage of technology, they're not going to compete and lead. They will not be able to compete and lead. So, and what, what are the focus areas for these companies when you talk about technology? One, the number one priority of any company, more so, and we can relate to our own companies, aviation companies and travel companies, is our ability to respond to changing market conditions on which we have no control, meaning how do we make, how do we use technology for me to become agile? Agility is a key theme. It's so important. Companies which could respond to this massive disruption did well, understandably, compared to companies which could not. And we have to also look at how do we respond to changing customer expectations. I'm talking about technology transformation. Today, the consumer behavior past the last two years have dramatically changed. Their expectations are, I can say that like this, they can have the next to read in less than a second. They can have the next movie in less than 10 seconds. They can have the next ride in less than five minutes. They can have the next meal in less than one hour. They can have the next fresh groceries coming in less than three, three hours. And any e-commerce purchase, they will be able to stipulate the time frame. This is something that all of us know, but this is innately changing our expectations. And companies, all of the air, big airlines, big travel companies, how do they respond to this changing customer expectations? And that is, how do you make travel better than just safer? And how do you amplify the consumption behavior of the people? How can we get the world to consume more travel? That's what we are all about. And th this is where they're all looking at technology. Now, how do you do that? Do you know your customer? If you actually people will buy if it is easy to buy. That's a very loaded statement. If it, for instance, when I am sitting in an airport, when I'm sitting in a plane, 14 hours flight, if some if the airline knows me and if they can give to me what I would like to buy, or if they know me. They would know what kind of things I consume. It doesn't have to be necessarily to be delivered there. Then I will buy. And so it's so important that we understand our consumer. All of this is going to come around from the 
uh, I'll, I'll explain it in a much more, uh, I would say, vivid manner. Take the case of our online deliveries, Uber Eats or Swiggy, when you order food at home. Just look at the value chain through the supply chain of that delivery, the farmer who farms and the logistics company, which is actually transporting food processing companies, warehousing companies, and finally the procurement and then coming to the restaurant and the chef. And of course, the investor in all of this. But absolutely 90% of the value will be captured by the company which is fulfilling or engaging with the consumer. Look at the valuations of all those companies. Every other player as an execution partner is commoditized. They all work on cost plus. And this fellow who is engaging the consumer, empowering the consumer, fulfilling the promise, is going to be the key person. And so customer loyalty, customer engagement, creating that network of marketing network of your loyal customers through your own brand is most important. Ladies and gentlemen, world has, technology has helped us to divide the world into two, producers and consumers. And I stand in between as the brand. It can be IAG, it can be Conscious, Virgin Australia, any of the companies. And on the one side, you have the travel producers. They could be the producer of the seat or any of the ancillary that they would consume. And I'm now able, technology now allows us to connect billions of suppliers, sorry, millions of suppliers with mil billions of consumers. And I stand in between as the brand my objective is that I'm able to fulfill the promise that I make to the consumer as a brand. And I take the, for fulfilling that, I take the travel supplies, I package them, I personalize them, price them, and deliver to the consumer in a manner that the consumer would like to wish consume in whichever medium as it is possible. And that's where the real value is. So how do you, create that community. For example, I was think about conscious loyalty or think about Air Canada, Aeroplan or Life Miles. Loyalty programs become extremely important if it can do much more than what it is doing today. And you can make a promise that regardless of whatever you consume, as I said, the travel GDP is only 10%. That means one in $10 is what's actually spent in travel. But if I have a coalition loyalty program and make this promise to the Australian people in Australia that 70% of all your spend will be recognized for rewards, that's a very powerful thing. So actually, these are some of the changes taking place and it is happening in an accelerated fashion. I don't know whether some of you would know that when it comes to IT services for the world, India is the, one of the biggest player in the world. Whether it is the services being delivered by IBM, Accenture, or Oracle, or TCS, Infosys, or any of them, most of them have hundreds of thousands of people, technology people working from India. I'll tell you, I, I can demonstrate that this trend is proven. The compound annual growth rate, and more so this year, of technology services is expected to be about 13% for the next five years, which used to be roughly about 5%. And this year, the growth is about 17.5%. In other words, there is so much of demand for technology that's actually happening because customers would like to use technology for addressing a, a lot of the challenges that they are actually facing or the opportunities that they have. That's on the technology front. That is the first topic that I wanted to. And here, we have to look at every area of our operation and what is going to be the future of that operation and how do I play there? The second change, the 
nature of jobs or the future of jobs. I'll tell you a, 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 a study report that came out and is from the labor, the, the stati labor statistics department of the United States, what's happening in the United States. From 2000 April to 2022 April, just a month back, the unemployment rate in the US has come down from 14% to 4%. That 14% is high because it was 2020 because of COVID. But it has come down to 4%. Same period, the job vacancies as a percentage of the employment has gone up from 2% to 4%. Do you understand? That means there are jobs there, but I'm not able to match the talent. So that's another very interesting observation that you can actually see. If you have heard about an institute, or institute called the Institute of Future, their forecast is that almost 80% of all the jobs in 2030 is yet to be invented. Of course, that's a, uh, I, I will consider that as an exaggeration to drive a point. However, it is true that there are major shifts taking place. I would say one, that is 25% of the world from tw this year onwards growing will work from remote. That's a third point that I would like to cover in my session. And the, the second point is there will be three to five fold growth in e-commerce. That's another very important change that we will be able to actually see. This year in 2022, in eight developed economies, 100 million jobs are getting shifted, meaning displaced, meaning that those jobs do not exist. But I have other kind of jobs for which I am struggling to find the skills. What I'm saying is not something new. McKinsey Global Institute, MGI, has come out with a study which they augmented, augmented from 2015. I've been talking about that internally and externally too, that with the available technologies, with the advent of artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, 50% of the world's jobs can be automated. Now, that did not go because of many factors, labor dynamics, uh, social security, blah, 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 all kinds of stuff, cost of technology adoption. However, COVID again has taught us the lesson. They, the COVID has accelerated that push. Yeah, now th this is another very important thing that we have to really look at. Now, future of jobs are changing. Skills are different, going to be on an on ongoing basis. Now, the third topic that I wanted to cover was that the, the operating models of companies are going to change. I heard the CEO of an airline, I don't want to name him, showing his absolute disappointment about employees wanting to work from home. CEOs are extremely upset that people are insisting to work from home. This is a change in the operating model. One of the things when you talk about, see, okay, technology allows us to work from home, study from home, entertainment at home, cure at home, food delivered at home, everything at home, yeah? Uh, I don't think, however, that is a great situation for us to be because human beings are wired a little bit differently. However, work from home or work from anywhere, this is again a, again a technology disruption, helps us in many different ways. Yeah, one, we will be able to hire, find talent from wherever they are. Previously, we always used to look at hiring people who can be attached to one of our offices around the world. Yeah? And second, we will be able to, some people 
who otherwise would have gone on sabbatical or would have taken uh, leave because they have special needs. They need that flexibility. We will be able to, they will be able to work because they can work from home. They can work flexible hours. And similarly, people who are differently able, who are perhaps physically challenged, they will be able to participate in the creation of future. Yeah? So, and similarly, for a lot of companies, we don't need to actually grow our infrastructure and assets linearly with our growth, with, our, with the headcount. So there are opportunities. But when it comes to, I, I don't know whether you are aware that most of the sectors have returned to office, either fully or partially, but IT companies still continue to work from home predominantly. And th that also is not the, the best of situations, but when we are driving, this is a change in the operating model. I can say, because we talked about future of work, I can also say this, the future of work should have flexibility as a value, a, a core value. Future of work will be flexible. People will be working flexible. We are not going to get up every day morning and dress up and go in one direction and in the evening go in the opposite direction. That's not going to be the case. And I think organizations have to be ready to take advantage of this opportunity, not to see this as a, as a, uh, as a, as a downside. But when it comes to returning to office or work from home or work from anywhere, it's very important for companies, if you are facing this problem, it's very important for you to explain clearly the purpose why you want your employees back to office. It cannot be, and smart leaders will be able to explain that. It cannot be that because we were all working from office, that we have to now have everybody working from office because I have the comfort. That cannot be the reason. You must have a very good purpose, and there are valid purposes. For example, how do you foster your culture, co-creation, teamwork, relationships, innovation, driving communities, a sense of community feeling? All of that is important for us to be at our productive and our creative best. So there are valid reasons for it. So the future of work, in my view, will be hybrid. And one of the core values will be flexibility. And then we got to be... The third point is alignment. What do I mean by alignment is? A manager might think that working from office is better than working from home, whereas his team member may think differently. And we have to really find alignment while making those choices. Yeah. And again, we will find our feet as we go along because everybody is trying to see how you get your employees back to work, back to office. But uh, that's another uh, interesting area. That is what we talk about as the, the the change in the operating models. A lot of airline companies are because he was complaining. There is a very interesting comment from Tim Clark of Emirates Airlines saying that stop actually complaining and get down to it because the airlines are complaining that the airports are not ready. They don't have enough people to work and things like that. And there's a lot of summer rush that's coming. And and by the way, I don't know whether I whether you guys have noted this. Thanks to the summer bookings, the seven day moving average. Of bookings in the month of May. The international travel exceeded domestic travel booking index. Booking index means compared to what it was pre-COVID. Yeah, that is actually a lot of people are trying to travel, and the, so the the seven-day booking averages are uh, moving forward. Now, I also want to, uh, before I come to the final points, I want to talk about a little bit about where again we are. You know, I talked about the global travel GDP, the size of GDP is quite big, 10 trillion, roughly. And we are not today. We were 10 trillion, but we will get there. 
Now, you have heard about digital economy. Digital economy today is twice the size of that, 20 trillion. As I said, travel is such a big sector, dates back to the beginning of humanity, and it's only 10 trillion, whereas the digital economy is, it, that, that's where we are. And I just would like to, to you know, frame the contours of it. So what does it mean? If you really look at, if I look at the, the United Nations produce a report on digital economy every year. 2020 and 2021, they did not produce one. They produced one this year, 2022. And before that, the last report was 2019. And it clearly depicts the predicaments, the opportunities, all of it for countries or companies, economies, organizations and individuals. When I say digital economy, it is driven by our ability to collect, process and analyze massive amount of digital data. <clears throat> and it creates another attribute of this is in digital economy, massive amount of wealth is created at rapid times. But unfortunately, that wealth is concentrated in the hands of few countries, companies and more so few individuals. And it evolves at speed that we don't even recognize at a pace. The internet traffic used to be just one megabyte per second. One megabyte per second is today about 200 terabytes per second. And a very powerful value chain is created by firms who practice the collection, the processing and the analyzing of the data to create digital intelligence, which they will be able to monetize through commercial use. And in this world that we live, I talked briefly about, one of the significant factors is platformization. One of the key drivers is platformization. There are two types of platforms, you know platforms, Two types of platforms, transaction platforms like the Amazon, the Uber, the, the, the Airbnb. And also we have in a, which facilitates, you know, bilateral and multilateral exchanges. Whereas when it, there are other platforms in which we call it as innovation platforms, like the Android, the iOS plus the Linux, which actually facilitate innovation and collaboration. The massive amount of data that these platforms collect from exchanges and interaction from the customer is the reason why platform based business models are very powerful. And you should know seven out of the eight largest companies in the world today. By market capitalization, you employ platform based business models. <clears throat> and when you look at this digital economy. This again is a is more important for people who man the regulators and nation, the leaders of nations. See, when it comes to digital economy, unlike the conventional economy, there is no north side south divide. Actually, the majority of the story is between two countries. United States, 90% of digital economy is between these two countries. Yeah. And <clears throat> So if you if you look at 75% of the IoT spending, public cloud, and 90% of the market capitalization of digital economy is in these countries. And if you really look at the friction, the trade friction, or the friction that we actually see is a reflection of the quest of these countries to achieve or maintain dominance in these frontier technologies. And if I really sum that up, where in the in the universe where we do our business and we have our life. This is hugely influencing. The functioning of economies, organizations and human beings, the way we produce. Automated manufacturing, 3D printing, the way we distribute personalized direct 
the way we consume on demand, when we want, where we want, the way we transact real time, cashless, and the way we operate artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented and virtual reality. It's very, very changing. And this is the world we are living. And in fact, in this world, leaders and decision makers have to reset their intuitions. Very different world it is. We don't, we know it, but we don't, we are unable because we are a frog inside and we are getting boiled from cold water to where we don't quite realize it. However, even though it is deeply unsettling, it also presents huge opportunities. And <clears throat> that's where probably I would talk a little bit about the road ahead. We all, ladies and gentlemen, we are in airline travel business. We have been improving that business. We have been growing that business, but we have reached a stage where the disruption is pretty drastic. And my view is that I, what I've mentioned is that what technology has done, what COVID has accelerated it, is that the transformation from an operator to a brand owner is going to become much more faster than what we thought. It's not important that everything that you offer to your consumer is produced by you. Not at all. In fact, you don't really need to produce anything. So <clears throat> every airline, every tour operator, every um, uh, hotel company, they're all trying to say one thing. You consumer, whatever the customer, whatever you want, we provide you. So these three trends are going to come. Personalization, disintermediation, and virtualization. What it means is that me as the brand IAG, me as the brand American Airlines, me as the brand Air Canada is going to provide whatever that my customer is asking. I am able to do that. Technology allows me to do that because I can pick up the seat from wherever. I can get the room from wherever. I can have the show ticket from wherever. I will be able to, I know my customer. I will be able to package and price and personalize to him. And I become the brand and that's what is important. So personalization is going to be one of the most critical success factors of organizations going forward. Very, it will be very important for the success. Not only in travel business, in any business, what it means is that you give your customer what they need rather than what you have. Don't carpet bomb him with what you have, sharpshoot him. That's what it means. And it will improve his consumption behavior and he'll consume more. Now, if I take Another sector, education on personalization. This is applicable in all sectors. When we talk about education, when you talk about universities, we think about the Harvard University or the brick and mortar, the buildings, the campus, but it's becoming now borderless. Instead of all those classroom lectures, we will have virtual classes. I'm not talking about smaller classes. Instead of degrees that you have to go through, it's going to be micro credentials. I just want to do three years of journalism and thereafter, this is what I'm going to pursue. I want to do just photography. I don't want to be a three years program. So I can give, in other words, ladies and gentlemen, from a supply focus, the world is going to be demand focus at the granular level. Even in the past we were, and we, but that's just some sort of a macro level. But today with millions of producers and billions of consumers connected digitally, we will be able to actually manage that and provide using the, you know, based on the demand. And me as the airline, me as the travel company is sitting in between as a, as a brand. And that is the change. And why would you do that? 
because you would be able to therefore respond much more realistically, much more faster to conditions on which you have no control. I will be able to throttle down my cost commensurate to the revenue pressure that I have on the other side. And that's one of the reasons and, and I will be able to absolutely drive economies of scale. If I'm going to do the flight operations or crew planning for an airline having 50 planes or 100 planes, I would like to do it actually for 1000 planes. I drive economies of scale and being able to operate that smartly is going to get commoditized and I would like to actually do drive economies of scale. So in operations and in production, production excellence and on the consumer side, engaging the consumer to amplify his consumption behavior to grow the industry the way we want to grow the industry. And, and that is an as a technology company, IBS, we should be, IBS software should be driving these philosophies and supporting these trends. And that's what we are committed to doing. And so that is, in my view, that is going to be the road ahead. When you look at all of the uh, travel companies, whether it's an airline company or a hospitality company or a cruise company or a tour operating company, if they are operating, operating excellence is so important. If you have been doing with uh, Mickey Mouse computer systems, it's high time that you have standard high quality systems. It's important. And you have to have this kind of a model being supported. So personalization, disintermediation means how do you take your products and services directly to the consumer bypassing non value adding intermediaries? There will always be intermediaries, but they will be they should be value added. And why should you have you know, intermediaries? Because we want to asset optimize all the time. Whatever that we produce has to be just in time. So certain amount of aggregation, there's certain amount of intermediation will improve those principles of economics. Yeah. And so that is the route that I guess the world will go. And technology will play a very, very important role, and all of you are in it. So, Daniel, I think I have come. Uh, I've taken a bit longer than what I thought, but uh, that's where I am. So I'm OK to take questions if there are any questions. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And I know I will take one more minute. If I don't do that, it'll be an ingest. I'll be it'll be unfair. So the women in aviation and the role of women in aviation. Yeah, and that's the the aviation women panel. And if I don't speak at least something. So here again, let me just talk a bit about the facts and figures. There was a McKinsey study that was conducted recently. Two interesting observations. During the last five years, the total number of senior execs that is in the C-suite, the absolute numbers in 600 companies where they conducted the survey has gone up from 17%, the total number, to about 21%, not dramatic. However, the total number of companies out of the 600 in five years back in their sample, it was about 29% had women in the uh, CXO level, the C-suite, the leadership. Now it's about 44%, still not great. But they also did one more survey and you would have read it. At least some of you would have read it. That's diversity, say diversity win report. Diversity wins report. They produced is in which they have with facts and figures. They have demonstrated that companies with the most diversity outperformed the companies with the least diversity by 48%. By 48%, I even I couldn't believe that fully, but uh, they always present with facts and figures. Now, if I look at another side, if I look at the travel and tourism sector, our side, 55% of all of the employees are women employees. 55%, but not, as I said, they're for different reasons, they 
have not come to the uh, sea levels to the extent that they should. But out of the 55%, only 8% make it to the senior leadership. And in managerial level, uh, only 20%. So there is a lot of headroom to, to grow, and it should. And, and 25 at 25 uh, is an initiative of IATA for increasing the women representation in the aviation industry to at minimum 25% by 2025. So I think the, the companies which have not taken specific initiatives, they should have a, enough motivation to proceed because again, if you have gender diversity, the productivity is definitely going to be much higher. And, and, and all of you should be happy that the first and the only uh, women president and CEO of WTTC is a lady called, I, I can't pronounce it, so she's Mexican origin, Gloria Werner. When, yeah, sorry, I, I, sorry, I can't pronounce. So I think I've, I, I fulfilled my responsibility of talking a little bit, bit about women in aviation and the leaders in aviation. So Daniel, on that note, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I hope it was useful. Uh, I enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thank you, VK, Thank you, VK. and uh, amazing, uh, amazing information. information. And I see already I see a lot already of already questions here in the chat notes. notes. So before I hand over to Emma, because Emma, it's really amazing. It's past midnight and you're still with us. So it shows also the commitment of our members to the session. Um, you, you can see VK here, we have the RISE logos and uh, Anne as one of the founding members of this club was initially suggesting to call Ladies Beyond Flying All Girls Club, because we all know there's an all boys club within the industry. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and, and you were just talking about the CEO who is reluctant to agree on uh, working from home and so on. So what is your view on this? How will this old boys club hand over more actively responsibility to uh, ladies in aviation? And I think we have discussed earlier in other sessions, all these ladies here, they, they are willing to evolve, they are willing to take over responsibility. And very often in all discussions, we come to the point, the old boys club is always keeping the ladies out. So can you give some hints for the ladies to break into this old boys club? We, what I, uh, from my own experience, I can say, um, we used to have, we still have few uh, lady members in our senior leadership. And some of them had to discontinue because of this, some special circumstances, personal circumstances, uh, which needed their attention at home because children uh, at certain uh, level of education and that requires attention uh, and, and things like that. Uh, it's, uh, now, if it was in 2022, that wouldn't have happened because she could have easily worked from home at a flexible time. Uh, and, and so therefore it gives technology itself gives opportunity uh, and the the McKinsey gen, uh, diversity wins report is is a factual record that if you have gender diversity then you have productivity that should be a motivation because for the companies you would like to have a productive creative innovative working group yeah that's what companies should have um, so I think there should be deliberate board level interventions to make sure that you have good balance. And, and within IBS, <clears throat> we have about 42% of our workforce is women. But when it comes to managers, it's 28% uh, globally. I, I still, we have a lot of room to, to improve. And particularly when it comes to, to senior leadership level, that's where uh, it, um, you know, women make a choice of not uh, going there, but I think technology allows. And also, it's a it's a social aspect. Uh, how do you share the workload? And 
in, 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 you know, you won't believe this when the work from home. Was resisted or at least work from office was requested more by women than men. <clears throat> because in when women, when the mother is at home working, she has a full project to run, manage. But the kids, if they are at home, they will run to the mother. And maybe the parents will have a tendency to, or the lady member would feel that I should take care of them and things like that. So I think the, the social infrastructure and the social mindset also is an important one. But the, the, the single biggest driver is the proof of the pudding. Yeah. OK, Daniel. Emma. Thank you, Emma. So um, you asked the question and I see also in the in the chat um, there is a lot of uh, communication also with Anne and Fatima about this airport topic and maybe you want to ask mm -hmm. uh, VK your question uh, verbally um, and then also maybe Anne giving some background from Scandinavia and then listening to VK's perspective on, on the airports. Yes, certainly. Um, yeah, I guess I'm I've I've been with Virgin Australia now for only 12 months, so the airline industry is new to me. Um, I did work for our airports corporation prior to joining the airline. Um, uh, my question was, have you got any tips on how to work with our airports to help us with the end-to-end -end frictionless customer experience? Because often our customers don't understand that the airlines particularly in Australia, I don't know if it's the same, but we don't have much control or influence over the airport experience. Um, so, yeah, any tips on how we can make, you know, that end-to-end -end more experience more seamless would be appreciated. And maybe before you answer, VK, let Anne add your standpoint from the Scandinavian um, experience and the airports you were mentioning and why you have to still manually check in maybe you can also ask your question Anne. well i mean my well first of all vk i want to say thank you that was an excellent um talk you you gave there was just so you know i'm very passionate about some of the questions or the topic you raised so thank you for that um thank you, Anne. well when it comes to, to the airports it's it's fascinating that they you know it is one segment that's made uh, a lot of money in the past and actually continuously make a lot of money and what really frustrates me when it comes to airports well first of all how different they are it's like I gave the example in the chat I mean queuing now at Helsinki airport is four minutes and you don't have to remove any liquids or laptops or what have you and the queue at our land airport Stockholm is is three hours so <laughs> there's there's clearly a, a you know very dysfunctional airports out there and I had a horrendous experience at London Gatwick uh, on Saturday that was surreal um, that's all I can say. Um, it seems like, you know, I really wonder about the airports. Why why can't we have like check in for all airlines? Why, why can't check in be seen as a product? Why are airports unable to actually, um, um, you know, uh, be, be the owners of products and actually for the airlines then just to resell uh, the, the, the products for them? Um, I really wonder why we haven't really moved on in, in this space or why some some airports haven't moved on, adding to some of Emma's thoughts there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the sad part of the, the, the reality is that people have choices of airlines, but you cannot choose. You don't have that much choice when it comes to airport. If I'm coming to Brisbane, uh, I have to use the Brisbane airport. So if Virgin Australia or Pons, all of them, of course, you know, some cities have some choices, but we don't have that choice. So we have to really see how we bring alignment. But before going there, uh, the, the, the real misery at the airport, particularly Europe and US airports uh, now, as the, the, the traffic picks up, is because we thought, airports thought, airlines thought that we can actually sign off the employees and then bring capacity as the demand grows. 
That was proven completely wrong worldwide. We are unable to bring capacity as we think because a lot of those people at the airport particularly who were doing low wage work, they don't want to do that work and they are able to become kind of gig workers elsewhere. That means today I don't have to be a full time employee of a company. I will be able to work. Three hours, two hours, and there are apps that is facilitating creating that opportunity for them. So one is uh, and the issue is more about how do they ramp up the capacity? But you ask me that question. Yes, airports will and the airlines will ramp up the capacity. It will take a bit of time, but it will happen. Now, fundamental problems are still there, which even if they ramp up, how do you make them accountable? Like what Emma said, how do you how they will become accountable for providing that seamless customer experience for them? Every landing and every passenger or every flight, wide body, whatever is the one which gives them the money. The customer experience, they don't care when if they're coming to Brisbane or if they're coming to say Dubai, you have no choice but to land here. So how do I bring one? We can do technology can do quite a lot of things to improve the seamless movement of passenger through the airport, which airline and the airport can work together. But much more important thing is how do you bring a little bit of stake in the whole travel and the traffic for the airport? Because they're a monopoly now in, by and large. And how do you bring some element of alignment there? That means, and we have to think about it, passengers going through the airport, their response and their reaction, their assessment has something to do with what the airport gains. They will have a base, but they will have something more. Now, it has two aspects. One, the business process itself, how do we achieve that? Second, supporting that through tools and technology. You cannot do this. This has to be pretty objectively done and transparently done by the passengers. And which is going to be, and if the airport function is improving, then the airport has something to gain, regardless of the fact that in any case, anyway, the flight will come. So bringing in some sort of an ownership, accountability, and something for them to gain. Today, they have nothing to gain because that flight will land there. Those passengers will go through that and number of you understand. So the of course, it's a this is a problem that is uh, always discussed. Um, but maybe now we have greater opportunities, Emma. Thank you, VK. So, uh, Maria, you uh, have some good questions from the uh, cargo industry, maybe you want to raise your questions and you were also then asking um, regarding um, VK's recommendation um, for other organizations regarding um, inclusive awards. Maybe you want to raise your questions from your cargo perspective again, Maria. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, first of all, thank you, VK. Uh, this was a phenomenal session. I thoroughly enjoyed these uh, learnings and your our predictions and the studies you mentioned from McKinsey's side, so appreciate that. Um, yeah, I was just stating uh, it was really more of a comment that I just switched my gears from the passenger side into cargo side of things, and I'm realizing that more and more um, partners in the industry are looking to invest to digitize the cargo world because in the 2020, uh, 2020 during the pandemic, it uh, brought spotlight on the cargo side of things, and now people actually want to invest and digitize that uh, part of the uh, industry. So that's good to see. Um, my real comment really or uh, question really is around um, uh, I was noticing that the IBS uh, software itself won an award for uh, gender inclusivity. I think that was in like 2016, uh, which I, I'm very happy to see. What message uh, would you have for other organizations to promote that sort of uh, inclusivity within their own organizations to achieve that level? What benefits do you see? I heard you mention a couple of times that, you know, the more uh, women you have, there's more diversity. You uh, you find value in doing that. What would you say on a larger platform to other organizations so they promote that sort of uh, inclusivity within their own organizations? 
<clears throat> first and foremost, um, uh, it, it's absolutely clear for companies like IBS, it's relatively easy because you have almost equal. We have some batches of people whom we take. We have more women than men in a batch. So when fresh freshman comes from the university, um, when they go through the, that's not because of any reservation or anything. Women qualifies better than boys, and and we have batches where we have more women. So it's it's relatively easy. And in the software industry, it is absolutely no uh, difference between a boy and a girl who is working. Um, and and if I so it's relatively we didn't have to do anything uh, to achieve better diversity. The, whereas when it comes to other areas, particularly um, uh, I, human intensive uh, and areas and certain kind of work, traditionally people thought that it has to be done by men. But the good thing now is that we are seeing more and more technology and information technology workers in, in managing many things. Yeah? The, the physical activities are done by robots and they are controlled by people. So there is an opportunity naturally there. But it's also great that there is so much more focus on diversity. Um, if you if you want to, uh, not only diversity in ESG, I didn't talk about ESG, on ESG and diversity, there's so much focus. So hopefully it will happen. And more reports like what McKinsey is, has done will be of great value because it's proving that the productivity productivity is not just one two percent; it's much higher. Is what they're actually saying. What more can uh, substantiate than the real data? So um, that's what I, I that's how I I would answer that. Thank you. Yeah, we come uh, to the end of the session. First of all, it is the largest aviation women panel ever with most questions ever. So I'm really uh, amazed. Let me ask you my last question. So looking back the last three years, what was the best moment for you? Vicky? Last three years? Yes. Yes. When in, I, I, I must say this in 2020, February, uh, March 6th is when I uh, took the last flight before COVID. I came to Dubai. I was come. Uh, I was in the U.S., then in India, and then back to to Dubai. And all of us are in lockdown, and the whole world is uh, coming to a grinding halt. And the first and foremost thing that was going through my mind is. We have a company with uh, people from 40 different nationalities around the world. And we are talking about a disease and we have no idea. We don't have any experience of handling, managing. You don't know what's happening and you see all of those. Very scary pictures in the television in Italy and in Spain and in US and all places. And the first and foremost thing for me was to see how do we take care of the employees? Um, the health and safety of the employees was the number one. Of course, my family is uh, number one, one, but uh, after that, the, the employees. Then the second one is still there are flights. And how do we provide business continuity support to our customers? And because we, nobody is coming to office and most of our work, people used to come to work. And the third piece is that I was not really sure whether we will have any revenues coming because airlines are not flying, airports are not operating. So how do we protect, how do we make sure that we have enough cash to survive this crisis? And the third, the fourth piece was if things go all right, how do we make sure that we have reasonable productivity? <clears throat> and the, you asked me this question. All of my board members 
they are all very eminent board members. Someone who is the chairman of AIG today, someone who was running uh, travel port, someone who was running Unilever. Uh, all of them advised me, VK, preserve cash. You have to lay off. You a dollar going out of the window is not going to come back. And I faced this once before in my life with IBS. So this time also I thought this is not the right moment for me to actually uh, send people out because the, there's no jobs there. Everybody is paralyzing. So the most I took a decision that we are not going to lay off anybody. We, of course, uh, trimmed a little bit in the sense of we introduced some variable pay. That means if we are going to achieve break even somewhere, then you will get the full pay. Otherwise, <clears throat> compromise a little bit. But senior people were always on an incentive pay. Uh, that's all. But we we held together. We stayed together. And we came out successful and we did even in 2020, 2021, our financial year is Mar April to March. Almost all of the people, in spite of all the troubles, because we made enough money that they didn't have to compromise their pay. So they made the take homes and <clears throat> we didn't uh, lay off even a single employee. And then when I look back, I feel that was the uh, the best decision that I've taken, and if I look at, that was the best thing that I done during the last three years. I would add to this, there is maybe one more best moment when I ask you, can you join Ladies Beyond Flying monthly aviation panel, and you agreed on it. I think that was the very, very best moment. <laughs> Let's thank so you for your time. I thank you very much um, that you were joining us today and were sharing really so much information about the future of travel and how you see um, the industry evolving. Uh, also good news from our side. So this week we achieved a new milestone. We are now 700 members strong and uh, also many of you saw this in our LinkedIn group. Uh, LinkedIn has um, included us in a very special program because we are one of the most engaging LinkedIn groups, thanks to all the members and uh, the postings. And let's look uh, shortly into the future. Uh, next month, we have another great aviation women panel, one um, IBS software customer, American Airlines Cargo. Jessica Tyler is going to speak about transforming air cargo. And then we are having a very special presentation from meanwhile, she is called Nicole Jackson because she Merit, uh, but formerly known as Nicole Crabtree from Commute Air, about how she was managing uh, the pandemic, uh, being a mother, a bride, and also as a C director. Then again, we touch the sustainability uh, to topic, and uh, yeah, then um, we are also looking already who could be a model and um, a presenter in October, November. And uh, so I hope you all stay healthy and safe. And um, you are going to join us also in the future. And until we see each other soon again, I wish you a fantastic rest of the day. And Emma, have a good night for you in Australia. Thank you. Yes. Bye bye. Yes. yes. Thank she you. She needs invitation for staying out. Thank you once again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank bye you, VK. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.